Small Films programmes speak to them in ways that children would recognise immediately, from the integration of recognisable real world and imaginary settings, the use of what appear to be familiar toys come to life, and the routines of childhood play, to the homemade textures and handheld qualities of the puppet's movements. Stop motion animation programmes for children in Britain in the 60s and 70s have been pretty much consistently neglected by scholars in both television studies and animation studies. Now, the programmes that were made by Gordon Murray Puppets, Film Fair and Small Films, Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman's company, are remembered and much loved by a generation of children who grew up with Windy Miller of Camberwick Green, the Clangers, Parsley, the Lion of the Herbs, and adults in their 40s and 50s can pretty much always complete that line that starts pew pew Barney McGrew. Yeah, that one. Um, so these programmes are remembered by the children who viewed them with deep affection and are often actually still passed down to subsequent generations. So it never fails to astonish me that m even my teenage students um, are familiar with programmes that I watched in the late 1960s and early 70s and they fall upon um, this replica clanger that I knitted for my little boy from the original pattern um, made by Joan Furman, Peter Furman's wife, with cries of recognition and a kind of nostalgia which um, can only really be cultural because they don't remember these programmes, they've been passed down. But this, that's not an atypical response to British stop frame children's programmes of this period. There are lots of websites and organisations which remember and celebrate those programmes. And shops like this one, uh, near where I live in Birmingham, called I Had One of Those, um, sell old fashioned toys, including television themed ones. So there we've got the Wombles and Clangers and Sooty. Um, in the corner and they also sell things like um, traditional sweets in paper bags by the quarter pound, that kind of thing. Um, and television as well remembers its own past through these programmes. So Bagpuss, and I know that's a particular favourite here, so I've added in some bits of Bagpuss um, for your delectation later. Um, Bagpuss came first in a BBC poll of the nation's favourite children's television programmes in 1999 and it came forth in a Channel 4 poll in 2001. And more recently, Life on Mars, this is the um, remaking of the um, um, clangers for CBeebies, um, to make it, I think I've lost a, I think I might have lost a slide, oh no, okay, we'll start there. So clangers has been remade last year for the BBC, um, so that the newest generation of small children can enjoy this programme which was a pleasure to those of my generation and interestingly the choice was made to stay with the stop frame process rather than turning to CGI to remake this programme um, and also to stay with the original knitted puppets rather than making them in a different way. Um, and here we go, um, Life on Mars played, paid tribute to Camberwick Green as well. Um, so you can see that these programmes have remained really powerfully present um, in the contemporary moment and there's a real nostalgia industry around these programmes and this body of work. But what I want to argue is that there's more as well. It's not just a matter of simple nostalgia for childhood, although that does play an important part. So despite the ongoing cultural um, attention these programmes receive, they haven't had attention in works on television and animation history and they've had little to no attention at all in works on criticism or theory so they're never used as examples um, when talking about animation or children's programs really and I will address the, the one or two exceptions to that tendency in a minute. What you do get is attention to the output of Aardman animation who made um, Wallace and Gromit and of course Morph much earlier in the 1970s and you get um, mention of Aardman, for example, in histories of the stop frame animation process. So, for example, in volumes that look at the work of Ray Harryhausen, who made the kind of stop frame monsters of the um, action movies of, of the 50s. Um, you do 
have an acknowledgement from people like Nick Park and Peter Lord of Ardman that this body of programming from the 60s and 70s was incredibly important to them in developing the work that they've done at Ardman. And while they do appear in books, kind of popular history books like this, and also uh, memoirs of people who worked in the industry like Anna Hume, um, it's interesting that they're almost entirely absent from scholarly work um, on British television in general and on children's television in particular. And so I want to kind of pause to talk a little bit about the places where you do get attention to stop frame animation more generally before I kind of talk a bit about why I think it's the case that this set of programmes um, have remained absent. So in film, TV and animation studies, serious attention to stop frame animation is almost entirely limited to work on early cinema, to um, the US TV figure Gumby and to the work of Eastern European artists and I apologise to everybody for my accent here. So Yuri Trunka, Ladislav um, Starovich and Jan Svankmeyer and also to the Quay brothers, the American animators, um, who have been very clearly influenced by that body of Eastern European film work um, from the 40s, 50s and 60s. So my, my kind of um, summing up of that tendency then is that it appears that stop motion animation can be taken seriously if it can be framed within discourses of art, if it can be seen as kind of part of an independent or a kind of avant-garde um, movement, if it's international and perhaps critically if it's addressed to an adult audience. So those seem to be the conditions whereby stop frame animation is taken seriously in the academy. Typically, where that work occurs, readings of stop frame film, because television is almost completely absent in any of the work on stop frame animation, positions that film work within a theoretical framework of the uncanny. And quite often that is based on a slight misreading of Freud's essay, uh, which um, present company accepted, I have to say, Michael, which ignores the part where Freud argues that what figures as uncannily frightening in a real world context is really very different within the imaginative literary or in this case audiovisual world. So it's my suggestion that British stop motion programmes for children of the 60s and 70s should be repositioned in histories of television and animation. And I'm not just suggesting that because they're much loved and produced as significant in contemporary media culture. But I want to argue this because I think these programmes represent a really important moment in the history of British children's television in a number of ways. The first way that they do that is um, because this was innovative and actually very rich work, often, made by independent, typically cottage industry or amateur creators on a very small budget. And those achievements really should be recognised and written back into historical accounts of television and animation. And second, this relatively small body of programming had an enormous impact on the British children's programming which would come after it and is still endlessly visible in contemporary children's programming today. And that's not my focus today, but I thought I would just emphasise the point with some examples. Um, so if we look at these kind of contemporary children's programmes, so we've got uh, The Adventures of Abney and Teal down here at the bottom. Rasta Mouse. How many of you have seen any of these programmes? Like some of us, yeah. Um, Timmy Time and Twirly Woo is the most recent one. Um, even if their stop frame aesthetic is approximated digi digitally through CGI, it is still kind of harking back to this moment where the stuttering um, uncertainty of the stop frame process seems to produce a particular kind of affect for the audience. And it's still incredibly um, powerful within contemporary children's television and the remaking of the clangers in that way obviously speaks very directly to that. So what I'm calling a handmade aesthetic, so the ongoing use of puppets which appear to be handmade in some way, whether that's sewn or moulded or constructed, um, and the particular qualities of motion which are associated with the process of moving them incrementally and filming them and then running those images together. Um, 
is a, is a legacy which comes directly from small films, from film fair and from Gordon Murray puppets via Ardman. And that televisual history is part of an ongoing tradition of British film stop frame animation, which is actually evident from the earliest trick films in the late 19th century in Britain. So part of what I'm trying to do is to position this body of programming in a much longer history of film and television aesthetics. Um, and I often cite John Corner, but, and I'm going to do it again, when he said in 2003, talking about the value of historical television studies, and said, an enriched sense of then produces a stronger imaginatively and intellectually energised sense of now. So for me, I think it's really important to understand where the contemporary aesthetic, and I'll go on to talk about the pastoral emphasis, which is still really present, in particularly in preschool children's programming, also comes from this body of work. And I'll come on to that now with the third reason that I think it's important to go back to these programmes, is that they're significant for a remarkably consistent set of themes and concerns which speak very directly to the discursive context of the 60s and early 1970s. They repeatedly demonstrate um, a concern with reiterating and remaking a pastoral English past in what was a context of radical social change around gender, race and sexuality, but also around science, technology and the environment. At the same time, these programmes present a gentle acknowledgement and worrying over that change while insisting on the value of what came before at the same time. Now, the particular countercultural values of that moment, which um, included an interest in handcrafting, in the use of natural materials in the face of rapidly developing man-made materials like plastics and industrial mass production, for example, that context meant that alignment with the counterculture was also simultaneously an alignment with the past, which included a resistance to change and the future and development. There's a real discursive complexity around this, I feel, um, and it's what enabled the programmes to feel simultaneously old-fashioned, because they seemed to be harking back to the past, but because they were in tune with the, ca the contemporary counterculture, they also felt like they were of the contemporary moment at the moment of their production in the 60s and 70s. And their themes, concerns and their aesthetics really do remain visible in children's programming now. But that means something very different. I think we have to think quite carefully about what that means in this moment. Um, 50 years later, the retention of those values means differently because it's a different set of nostalgic concerns when the world has changed significantly rather than being in the process of change. So like we ha the world has changed and so those values of handcrafting, a return to a kind of Victorian past, an Edwardian past even, read na now much more overtly as conservative whereas they were available to be read as politically resistant in the 60s and 70s. So I think we have to be a little bit careful about just transferring the meaning that might be available in that earlier period to the programmes now. Um, I think there's more to be thought about in relation to that and I'd be really interested to hear your views on that um, later on. But to return to my reasons for re-evaluating this body of work, and this brings me to my fourth and final point and the one that I'm going to elaborate on, which is the question of stop frame animation aesthetics. Now, part of the countercultural mood of the 60s and 70s, that moment, was a renewed interest in handmaking, the use of natural materials, and small scales of production, largely in resistance to the advance of capitalist economies and associated modes of production and consumption. And it's that craft aesthetics of the handmade in its relationship to stop frame television that I'm going to focus on. Now, given the absence of attention to this work outside of the celebration of European art cinema, it seems to me that these children's programmes, which clearly have been deemed just too simple to attend to, offer us a significant opportunity to theorise what the appeal and enchantment of that particular process of animation might be. And to begin, I want to just kind of mention a phrase that was um, 
once used by Richard Lewis, who wrote the Encyclopedia of Cult Children's Television in 2001. It's a kind of flippant phrase, but it was really incisive when he said that these programmes have what he called a lurching charm. So like that idea that it's the lurching nature of the animation that makes them charming is what I want to try and unpick and what I hope the book unpicks. So I'm going to try and outline the argument in the book. Um, I don't need to plug it because you've done that for me already. But my basic argument is that if we theorise the differentiated qualities of movement produced across these programmes and try to specify their ontologies, we can understand what that might mean, the idea of lurching charm. And by doing that, we might understand better why they continue to hold this enchantment for children then and now grown up. Um, so, I deal in the book with the work of film fair and Gordon Murray puppets and small films, but I'm going to focus this afternoon just on small films, and in particular, um, their first stop motion series, The Penguins, which was shown on ITV's small time slot in the afternoon in 1961, and also the 1967 BBC Watch with Mother series, Pogles Wood. Um, but I will also show a clip from um, Trumpton as well. Now these are, uh, there's a jigsaw from Trumpton in case you need reminding what it looked like. These programmes are the least commented on of the small films output, which has been entirely overshadowed in popular discourse by clangers and bagpuss. And I actually think that these are the most interesting ones, which is why I'm focusing on them. Okay. I'm going to come on to that, but I'll leave you with that rather poor screen grab from Bagpuss. So, small films produced a rich and innovative body of work across the 60s, 70s and 80s. And it's possibly redundant, but I'm going to mention it anyway, to talk about their cottage industry mode of production, which myth mythologically is kind of endlessly described as taking place in Peter's barns and pig shed. And I don't know if anyone's managed to get to the exhibition that's on at the Museum of Childhood in Bethnal Green at the moment, um, but there's an exhibition on s about small films there at the moment. I was lucky enough to go to the um, private view and meet Peter, which was a bit of a thrill for me. Um, but they've, it's tiny, the exhibition, and they've, they've set it up in one part of the museum, and they've set it up in a in a, the frame of a shed, a kind of lean-to shed. They've done it in timber. My husband and Peter Fermin had this moment where they said, oh, it doesn't look dirty enough, does it? It's really clean. All the timbers really, it smells like fresh wood and it's not quite right. But just the idea of them recreating the frame of a shed to put the exhibition in speaks volumes, really. Um, but Peter Fermin made the, the figures, the settings. He painted all the backgrounds. He did all the different kinds of animation in the programmes. And Postgate created those imaginative worlds through writing, voicing, and he did all the animation work too. The visual and sonic complexity of their work is really astonishing and, and worthy of serious consideration. Um, and Helen Bromley, who's one of the few people um, to have ever mentioned the work of small films in academic work. It, she wrote a really kind of personal, reminiscent essay, talked about how Bagpuss offered this kind of sophisticated, multivalent address to both child and parent. It's a really significant argument. It's in um, David Buckingham's edited book, Small Screens Television for Children, if anyone's interested in reading that. Um, now, there are lots of examples across small films work of that very complex use of multiple, multi-layered modes of storytelling, which incorporates stop motion, cutout animation, um, and also the compositions of Vernon Elliott, whom, who did the music for almost all of their work, and the way in which that addresses the child viewer. And Bagpuss is a really, really good example of that multi-layered, multi-method aesthetic and the complexity of address. The story world within Bagpuss's imagination is told in a contrasting way to the stop frame world of Emily's shop. So each of the stories that comes from Bagpuss's imagination will be told in a different form of animation so that you can tell that you're going into yet another story world. So it might be done through cutouts or watercolour illustrations, or as in this example, this is um, the last episode of Bagpuss actually, episode 13, called Uncle Fiedel. It's about a character, um, a doll, who's made of fabric. 
And the song in the episode, which is sung by Madeline the Ragdoll and Gabriel the Toad, is about his construction and the construction of the world around him from little scraps of fabric and little bits that are sewn together. They talk about the landscape being made of green velvet grass. And as you can see, figures are patchwork from scraps of cloth and the close-ups show us their hand-sewn construction. Uncle Fiedel makes a house by sewing together bits of fabric. We see the needle and thread and he gives it an applique fireplace and, um, and ornaments. But his beautifully made house won't stand up. It's too flimsy, it's made from fabric, it, it keeps fall falling over. It's a really sad, kind of sad episode in a way, but it's also, like so much of small films work, really deeply self-reflexive because th the question that it's asking effectively is to asking the viewer to think about the actual making of what they've seen. It's almost like it's asking the question, how do you make things that are made from fabric stand up and appear to operate as if they would in the real world? It's this really kind of deeply questioning um, approach to making children's television and to asking children to think about what they're seeing. So one of the things that I want to argue is that the address of these programmes is entirely unpatronising, inviting and commensurate. And I use the word commensurate to draw upon David Oswell's work in his 2002 book, Television, Childhood and the Home, which is a really amazing piece of work on historical children's television. Small films programmes speak to them in ways that children would recognise immediately, from the integration of recognisable real world and imaginary settings, the use of what appear to be familiar toys come to life, and the routines of childhood play, um, to the homemade textures and handheld qualities of the puppet's movements. Small films programmes encourage a child to look and to listen carefully to participate imaginatively and to search for the wonder to be found in the world around them as well as in the world of imagination. Now I want to focus on a particular example which combines stop frame animation and the use of stills photography in ways which mean that if, if this had been made by Chris Marker or Stephen Polyakov we'd probably be quite familiar with it because it's a really innovative and almost kind of avant-garde um, example of children's television from this period. So the extract begins, the one that I'm going to show you, as the magic plant which grows outside the Pogol's tree in the wood asks the characters and the child viewer to close their eyes while he conjures a story in words and pictures. When the plant says, open, we're suddenly in a secondary story world. And in that world, we watch a version of the traditional tale of the elves and the shoemaker, which is told through the editing together of still photographs plus the magic of stop frame animation, effectively producing inanimate objects with lives of their own. Now, it was a particularly strongly held belief of Oliver Postgate's that objects had inner lives. Um, and now the book's out, I can show you this, um, this letter, which I hope you can see. I'll read you a bit from it in a minute. This is a letter that I found in one of his files at the BBC's Written Archive Centre. And I was, I was going through piles of these files as you do there anyone who's ever been will know what it's like and I've been looking at his letters for days on end and suddenly I came across this one and the handwriting is completely unlike his normal handwriting so I was instantly drawn to it I mean his 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 normal writing was really kind of flowing and it and slanted to the right and quite loopy and very straight and you can see this goes up the page and it's a bit odd and he says Dear Ursula, who is the producer, um, here are the scripts for Pogel's Wood. Um, I shall be in town this Thursday with Pogel photographs. Shall I call on you to discuss the scripts? Ring me. I think this is a Pogel pen. I found it in my desk. It seems to write only as it likes. Very odd. And then at the end, he signed his name and said it nearly signed itself Pogel. You can see kind of that even in his everyday life, his kind of belief that in inanimate objects might have lives of their own and move on their own was really powerful. So here's the clip from um, this 1967 episode of Pogel's Wood, which is called um, Woodwork. Day became night, and he remembered how tired he was. Oh, 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 no time for being tired. I must get this table finished by first thing in the morning. Oh, dear. 
know, I must have a little nap. I can hardly see straight. I'm so tired. But the poor carpenter laid his head on a cushion of shame as he fell fast asleep. Not just a little nap. Fast asleep at his bench in front of all his tools and all the pieces of wood to bake the table from. What was to be done? He would never finish the table now. The tools and the wood and the glue pot knew he would not wake up in time to finish the table by morning. They would have to do something about it. There's such a lot I could say about that um, clip, but a few things that I would pull out is just to remind you, this, this is preschool children's television. This is for children under the age of four, four or five. We see the commensurability of the programme as a dress. It has children playing dress up, you know, using things like tablecloths and grown up and bits of cardboard to make the story. And in the use of stop frame animation and the editing together of still photographs, you have this encouragement to the small child of different ways of understanding visual storytelling. Um, and the focus on the space of the craftsman's workshop and the teaching of the value of the handcrafted object, because this story occurs because the child character in the Pogles thinks he can just knock up a table and chairs for Mrs. Pogle's birthday and can't do it. And, so the plant wants to teach him how important it is to value the craft of making things by hand. And the emphasis in their work on handcrafting makes me think of Richard Sennett's work on the craftsman. If anybody knows um, that work, it's really wonderful. But also, again, the self-reflexivity of all of um, Small Film's work. But it also led me in the book to reflect on the significance of the handcrafted object to all of the programmes that I talk about in the book and the relationship between that um, handcrafting and the discursive context in which they were made and the difficulty of disentangling those two things um, from the themes and concerns of the programme. Now I spend a large part of the book talking about handmade aesthetics but for now I'm just going to point to the way in which the majority of these programmes place emphasis on the handcrafted object. So um, in Camberwick Green the the characters revolve very slowly out of a musical box at the beginning of each episode, turning around very slowly in close-up so that you can see every detail down to the jointed hands and the carved wooden, the jointed wrists and the carved wooden hands. Um, the close-ups show the detail of the knitting of the toys, for example, so that you can see, even on a poor quality image on a tiny black and white monitor, you can see the detail of the knitted toy. So you can see that the, ping, the baby penguin there is knitted from Angora to make him fluffy and that it's knitted in stocking stitch and you can see that the penguin's eye is a kind of shiny black button. Um, and you could see the same thing in the example from Bagpuss, um, Uncle Fiedel. And then there was also paratextual material. So in each publication or annual that went with small films programmes and with um, the Gordon Murray Puppet programmes too, um, there would be a Make It At Home page, which and Peter Furman told me that like, he was really insistent that in every book they released there would be some way of encouraging the child to have a go at doing this at home and not just to be a kind of passive viewer but to participate and try to um, reproduce this at home, although clearly like, it's more likely to be the, the mother or care, carer figure in the child's life who's going to be doing this. Um, there's another one, Little Wire People, which is one of, um, one of the forms of animation that takes place in the story world within the Pogles. Um, 
So the aesthetics of, of the handmade across these programmes is coincident with a discursive context in the mid to late 60s which was worrying over capitalism, mass manufacture, man-made materials and, and where a kind of valuing of simplicity, the handmade and a return to the natural um, were, were very powerful. And all of that is very suggestive in relation to Patricia Holland's work on images of childhood where she talks about the residual power of the rural pre-industrial 19th century imagery which still surrounds childhood today and is still powerful in something like Abney and Teal um, today or even in the Night Garden actually. Now that's a really gross simplification for the sake of brevity but I hope you can see the connection I'm trying to point to between what was going on culturally and the aesthetics of these programmes. Now at the same time these programmes were made as products of a literal cottage industry which was in negotiation with the behemoth of the BBC um, and as Karen Lurie once pointed out in a paper, which is the only, um, it's unpublished, it was at screen in 2007, it's the only time I've ever seen anyone talk about small films in an academic context. She talked about um, the relationship between that, the kind of maker's mark, like the thumbprints you can see, for example, in the puppets of small films, and the discourse of touch in British, service television, British public service television where she talks about there being value in um, a sense of somebody having connection to the object that's been made, and that that is still a really powerful discourse in contemporary British television. Um, and of course, that maker's mark has been absolutely central to theorisation of craft, and is especially powerful in the work of small films. And I'll come back to Karen Lurie's argument. Um, but I want to look a bit more closely first at the ontology of stop frames, um, small film stop frame animations. And in particular, I want to think about the question of magical movement. Now, in The Penguins, the child viewer is encouraged to hold together two apparently contradictory ontological possibilities. Penguins are knitted toys and they repeatedly remind us of that fact in dialogue. But we're also supposed to believe that they're alive and living on the farm, that the, the real um, live action children at the beginning of the programme also live in. As I've said, the close-ups show the detail of their knitting and as the series progress, they become increasingly bobbled and anyone who's handled a child's knitted toy that's been through the washing machine and so on and cuddled constantly will know how ratty they get and the puppets get ratty in that way as well across the two or three seasons um, and there indeed is a visible trace of touch like we've got the evidence on screen of the touch of the maker in the process of animation or in the process of the child playing with a toy um, these are clearly made objects. When the penguins get wet, we see their bodies soaking at water and then being weighed down, made heavy. And they say things like, I'm soaked right through to my stuffing. So we're constantly being reminded that these are toys at the same time that they're moving apparently independently um, <laughs> and talking to us. Mrs. Penguin gets really cross when baby penguin tears his coat and she says, I must take you inside and stitch you up. And then we see her do it with a needle and thread. Um, now, at the very start of the series, Mr. Penguin tells us that he's been washed and hung out to dry. And there's a picture of him on the right, on the washing line. Um, and he does that nasally because his nose has been pinched by the peg on the washing line. But then he wriggles free and waddles off to see the new egg that his wife has laid. And this is a beautiful moment, I think, which sums up this moment where the child is supposed to accept that this is both a knitted toy that's been hung on the line, which you would see all the time, um, and to believe in their existence in the real. Um, so I'm just going to play you a clip which shows that, and it's so short I might play it twice. So hopefully it's going to work. Maybe not. I'll go back to that and find it in a minute. Um, so he wriggles and, and jumps down. So he starts off as a toy and then he becomes real. So for the child viewer, these programmes present a magical ontology, a magical world. There seems to be evidence that toys can come to life. And as Freud argued, that is not uncanny for children. It's a wish come true. Children want their toys to come to life. That's not a frightening thing. 
So the apparently indexical image, I mean, these programs are set against a real-world setting. They begin with live-action images of children and animals running around the farm. The in, this apparently indexical image appears to have captured a magical profilmic reality. We all know, you know, the camera nev never lies. I haven't got time to re rehearse all of those theoretical arguments about indexicality and movement. But I just want to highlight the way in which stop-frame animation often referred to in the early days of cinema as trick photography, in fact interrupts the direct recording of profilmic reality. And this is what Rob King has called diddling in his work on the early um, filmmaker Charlie Bowers. And it produces an apparently impossible indexicality which reinforces that play with ontological possibility that's signalled by the insisters that the characters are both made and alive. Rather than producing an uncanny experience of objects with lives of their own, and this really is the go-to position for all that work on Eastern European stop frame animation that's addressed to an adult spectator, small films programmes presented the child audience with evidence that of the magic that might exist in the real world if only they would look closely enough. And Postgator's narrator is always saying, look closely look more closely. He's always encouraging the child to pay attention. Now, the presence of the maker's hand isn't just visible in the thumbprint um, that Karen Lurie mentioned and that theorists of craft have remarked on. In stop frame animation, that presence is always already present because its movement is literally the trace of the animator's hand moving the figure. That's how it's made just as the child's hand holds and moves a toy around when it plays. And my argument is that it's precisely that action of the child moving an object around as they play that stop frame animation reproduces, echoes, reiterates, and which produces this kind of persistent commensurability and address to the child audience. It is the movement of children's play with small objects. And it's that stuttering, that play between presence and absence that can produce a feeling of haunting or magicality um, in this programming. And it's that presence-absence um, which Karen Lurie also talks about in, in this kind of paper that she eventually let me read um, so that I could include it in the book um, that's critical to what I'm arguing is a kind of magical ontology in small films programmes. Now when, as in the Penguins and Pogel's Wood, Figures are played against a real-world setting. Not only is that idea of animation as child's play foregrounded, but the stop-frame process, in contrast to how it works in a kind of made environment, like uh, in a studio, like Camperwick Green, the stop-frame process actually leaves the literal trace of the maker's movement in the image. So you'll get a wet, quickly disappearing footprint here, or an unnaturally rapid movement of foliage um, or flatting of grass as the wind blows through the foliage or the animator walks along the verge moving the, the um, toy as they move through space and ca it's captured in the stop motion process. So what can happen is that two differentiated temporalities are captured within the same frame and produce the kind of apparently indexical impression of an enchanted pro-filmic reality a ghostly trace of the maker, which even when it's glimpsed so quickly that you don't register it for what it is, produces this kind of enchanted and enchanting magical image, which actually really reinforces the archaic, mystical, rural idyll that these programmes insisted upon. And I've got an example from the Penguins, which I might have to um, go out of the PowerPoint to show you. If, oh no, we're all right. So, so we'll have to wait here and see if we can see one. So you can see what I mean about the kind of magical temporality that's captured. And it, you know, it's something that in the move to studio production, 
um, and not using the real world setting. It's, elimin it's eliminated as a kind of mistake. But what happens as a result of that is a much more kind of mechanical movement and a much more mechanical feel. And by contrast, um, I want to um, show you a clip from um, the much more prosaic um, Gordon Murray puppets programmes like Camberwick Green. And I'm going to show you the opening of Trumpton. And I'll just point out the way in which, in this clip, the automaton-like movement of the puppets is highlighted by the actual automatons who, automatons who are striking the hour on the Trumpton clock. And the rhythmic, repetitive movement which introduces the town and its inhabitants. And the quality of movement produced by this particular iteration of the stop frame process echoes and emphasises the regiment, regimented, orderly nature of the society in the villages um, of the um, Trumptonshire trilogy, um, in which everyone has their place and their role, and narrative disruption revolves around interruptions which might delay the afternoon band concert in the park, which ends each episode. Here is the clock, the Trumpton clock, telling the time steadily, of the puppets is really different there and that's because they were um, used either using magnets under the work surface or by um, using pins which meant that they had to lift lift the legs up and arms to move it's quite different from the very complicated armature that was inside the small films puppets and it produces a very different character of movement but nevertheless, it's, it's much less magical and much more prosaic. But the, whether it's gliding or a halting or lurching, stuttering movement that results from different ways of doing the stop motion process, it still echoes the qualities of movement um, that children have. When, I mean, you've all seen children kind of moving things along like this, playing with them or jumping them about, doing things like that. Um, there's a nice Lego figure, um, just to illustrate. And the effect of that in the programmes is often intensified by an angle of shooting which reduces, reproduces the child's perspective in play. So quite often the perspective is one of a child lying down on their belly, playing on the floor, so it will be shot from quite a low angle. At other times, as in um, that clip from Trumpton, you have a high angle, view down into a set which is a bit like looking into a doll's house or onto a diorama um, or a child playing in a kind of make-believe um, setting that they've constructed um, and the precise effect of that whether it's a magical or the worldly movement or a or a regimented one is also dependent on the number of alterations made to the figures in relation to the number of frames shot but also whether it's against a real world setting or in the studio it makes a big difference um, I mean, for example, in the Trumptonshire um, trilogy, I love this. Like, they use actual toys that you might have been able to buy at that time, you could buy at the time. So for the child viewer, like, this is a really powerful um, potential of effective connection to watch the toys that they might have, like that, that orange truck, moving around independently in the world of Trumpton or Camberwick Green. 
Um, and that is a very powerful commensurate address where the enchantment or lurching charm of, of that um, period of production of programming for children is also powerful for the nostalgic now adult viewer who looks back on their own toys moving around um, independently in these programmes. So I'll just conclude now. I want to leave us on this image. So um, if my argument about the significance and interest of these programmes is at all convincing, why have these programmes been neglected the way they have by scholars of television and animation? Well, on the most simple level, they sit at the bottom of a number of hierarchies in the order of things. They are popular, they're for children, they're television, they're animation, they're part of a tradition of model making and craft production, rather than the more elevated art which is associated with cell animation, for example. And I haven't got time to go over all those arguments about the cultural ordering of the arts and the crafts, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, these programmes appear deceptively simple, possibly too simple to warrant sustained attention, and they also fall within the category of the whimsical. Um, there's not very much writing on whimsy, surprisingly, um, but um, Warren Poland um, has a great piece, which is actually in the journal Psychoanalytic Quarterly, if anybody wants to look it up, um, where he talks about the whimsical as um, that ungraspable, playful, illogical category of delight. And he says it seems so out of place in the world of adults that it's then left aside to child's play where supposedly innocent children are thought to know no better. And these programmes, I think, are also not of the order of the uncanny, despite their focus on things that move on their own um, and which might make them of interest to theorists working within those paradigms on stop frame animation. And this is largely because of their address and their relationship with toys and other things um, which theorists have suggested. Children have a very different relationship to things than adults. Children can make things become anything in their play and their imagination, and it's completely unproblematic. And that brings me, finally, to the question of the adult relationship to things like toys, which I suspect might underlie the resistance to writing about these programmes. These programmes have not lain hidden um, in, a, in a loft like forgotten toys. Um, waiting to be rediscovered. They have remained present, really powerfully present, through repeats, DVDs, and all of the ways I outlined at the beginning, since their first broadcast 50 odd years ago. And perhaps the answer lies then in the discomfort that's associated of adults having attachment to playing with toys, models, miniatures, all of that stuff which culturally is perceived as a bit creepy, a bit nerdy. Um, and Walter Benjamin reflected a number of times on the charm of old toys um, and the psychic significance of old toys. And he said, when the urge to play overcomes an adult, this is not simply a regression to childhood. To be sure, play is always liberating. Surrounded by a world of giants, children use play to create a world appropriate to their size. But the adult who finds himself threatened by the real world and can find no escape removes its sting by playing with its image in reduced form. There's this kind of idea that it might have a psychic significance about control, possibly. So thinking and writing about stop-motion animated television for children is on the most profound level about playing with toys, from their creators and the mode of their creation to their mode of address to the act of analysis, and perhaps that's a little bit uncomfortable. So what I hope I've suggested is that there's more to this work, and particularly the work of small films, than just whimsy. In their programmes, there's a compelling commitment to suggesting the magical possibilities in the world. Um, crafted beings who live independent lives alongside humans and animals, unseen but with attention observable. In the work of small films, that is also deeply nostalgic um, and ar almost archaic in its commitment to the English pastoral past. Um, and the animator's touch and the absent presence of the animator and of the child's touch during play produces worlds that are defined by a kind of arcane ontology, critical to an address to the child audience and the nostalgic adult. For me, it's an address which is about humanity, connectedness, magic, and the nourishment of the imagination. So an address which is possibly specific to public service television, and it does persist in some children's television of today. So this image, which I'm leaving us with, I've, I've left it here because at the same time when you look back at these programmes, 
There are moments where you're just struck by the poetry and profundity that can be expressed through the movement or even the stillness of a stop frame puppet. So my example here is from an episode of The Penguins, which is just called Mrs. Penguin. It was broadcast in 1963, which coincidentally or not is the year in which Betty Friedan's important work of the second wave, um, The Feminine Mystique, was published. Something is wrong with Mabel, Mrs. Penguin. She's just sitting hunched up at the ends of, end of the doll's ironing board in the barn. The narrator, Postgate, tells us, penguins do get a bit squashed up looking when they're sad. The pog, who is a leather pig ornament that lives in the farmhouse, gives advice on the situation in return for um, a sniff of a lavender oil soaked daisy. He tells Mr Penguin, ladies are sometimes sad, but you can almost always make them happy by buying them a new hat and taking them out to dinner in a smart restaurant. Now, this is true, it has to be said. These solutions are fashioned out of odds and ends by the penguins and the problem's resolved. But that image of Mabel Penguin, immobile at the very end of a doll's ironing board, really lingers, is really effective, I think, in the combination of human emotion acutely observed and reproduced in the hand-worn surface of that puppet and its effortful hunching. It's a disturbing and, I think, perhaps genuinely uncanny um, telephiliac moment for the adult viewer who revisits this programme. I mean, for me, this was a moment of suddenly recognising, revealed in that expressive, effective, unusual moment of stillness in the animated image, a kind of truth about the historic and personal conditions of the childhood which, which could remain hidden in a whimsical, comfortable, nostalgic return to the television of your past. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.